So I think that that's a reasonable start to the conversation. At this point, uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions, we'd certainly be happy to take them. The AUMF signed in 2001 on the of war has been used to also justify uh, the warrantless wiretapping and now kind of warranted wiretapping program that, that works in the United States. It's been used to justify drone strikes in Yemen and other countries. It's been used to justify a number of other counterterrorism issues. If we were to say, here's another approach in Afghanistan, in other words, we're no longer at war in Afghanistan, um, to what degree is a lot of the pushback going to be based on a disinterest on the part of the administration and on the part of the uh, national security infrastructure in giving up all those cool tools? I served on the House Armed Services Committee. I've been in Washington for, for, for a while. Um, there's no group of people more powerful as, as, as President Eisenhower warned us uh, about. And the justification, this, this legislation that you um, uh, that you refer to, I think is, is uh, uh, it's a, the constant referral to that uh, law that, that occurred shortly after the 9-11 attacks is a justification for all the things that you suggested and such, and, and, and much, much more. And Gitmo and, and, and Bagram and so forth and so on is, uh, is frankly outrageous. And, and I think we need to challenge this administration on all of these fronts um, because there is so much uh, pressure uh, coming from the other side. I mean, uh, you, you know, if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? I mean, it's almost, like, you know, the military, it's, it's counterintuitive for, for you to tell someone in the military that, you know, if, as we increase the military, our military footprint in Afghanistan, you know, it's not making things better. It's not making things more secure. I mean, it's demonstrable. I mean, every month that passes, the number of U.S. soldiers who die increases, the number of Afghans, uh, Afghans that die increases. I mean, it's almost exponential. But, but from their point of view, uh, listen, it's a conflict. We're going to come in with the military, and that's how we're going to address this conflict. This administration has to have a political space, if you will, a political climate that allows them to stand up to the military and say, no, there is another perspective on this that we're going to employ, the diplomatic perspective on, on Afghanistan, the basic values of this country that are being undermined by, uh, by the, the, the various things that are, that are going on in the fight against uh, the, the terrorism. And the Congress needs to stand up and push the administration as hard as possible. Let me tell you, you know, even the administration's declaration that we're going to begin the withdrawal of forces from Afghanistan in July of 2011 has almost been abolished. I mean, on the one hand, he, he's made that declaration, but when you hear his Secretary of Defense go before the Senate Armed Services Committee and say, and say in answer to a question from Joe Lieberman, well, if conditions are such that it doesn't look like we should pull troops out in July of 2011, um, we won't. And maybe we'll even increase troop levels uh, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan in 2011. Uh, and when you look at Rolling Stone, the Rolling Stone story on McChrystal, when you look beyond the McChrystal stuff, and you read about what some of the commanders on the ground are saying in, in Kabul. They're saying, well, if we're successful, we think perhaps there'll be an escalation of forces in Afghanistan in July of 2011. And now we're hearing that the United States is interested, this administration is interested, in renegotiating the status of forces agreement with the new government in Iraq as soon as it's in place to extend the military presence of the United States in Iraq beyond the negotiated deadline of December of 2011. So, so they are going to push as hard and as furious and as systematic as they possibly can to move as far as we can toward this, this response of militarism. And we need to be much more aggressive and focused on pushing back. Uh, I'd like to uh, provide a uh, counterpoint. We've heard a lot about the military-industrial complex. At the end of World War II, the 800-pound guerrilla in Washington, D.C. was not the Department of Defense. It was the Department of State. Today, it is the Department of Defense. Because the Department of Defense has 435 constituents who have military bases, who have uh, 
GE aircraft engine producers, Ike Skelton after the second engine for the F-135, for the F-35, the F-136 engine program. The Department of Defense has congressmen and senators in their pocket who are sending lots of money to the Department of Defense and not so much money to the Department of State. To the point where the Secretary of Defense is cutting money over to state because the military wants to get out of the foreign policy arena. So I would encourage everybody to start telling their congressmen that that's inappropriate and that the United States military would love to get back to its core competencies which are providing security and to fight and win the nation's wars. Interested to hear your insight about. Um, so, not too long ago, during the uh, debate around the surge in Afghanistan, uh, one uh, usually progressive organization, the Feminist Majority Foundation, came out in support of the surge uh, to, in order to defend women in Afghanistan, which I find particularly ironic considering they're an older white female organization. And also, um, I live in Washington, D.C., and I've seen a lot of ads with a very menacing, menacing face now of um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad from Iran um, saying that, um, you know, promoting energy independence by demonizing someone who I have no love lost for. But it still seems very, very troubling to me how um, it seems very militaristic, this progressive messaging. So my question is, um, if what other progressive messaging out there is happening now that might be supporting this military industrial complex that we're trying to um, end. And um, if you had a memo to write to them, what would you suggest to change in their messaging? So, I think that it's important for us to acknowledge that particularly with respect to the status of women in Afghanistan, we have a country, and, a, and progressives, with mixed feelings about how we approach this problem. Uh, that a lot of people don't have a tremendously deep understanding of what's going on or what the trade-offs are, but three cups of tea has been at the top of the uh, at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for years now. It's the most popular reading uh, group book uh, in the world, which talks about uh, it helping and empowering women and children in Afghanistan in particular. Um, we had uh, after the invasion all of these images of uh, women being able to take off their veil, with these stories being told of women who had not been allowed to go see doctors, uh, and women doctors who had not been allowed to treat patients, suddenly being allowed to do so. Frankly, the feelings of most women in this country about Afghanistan, and especially progressive women, are a little bit mixed. The idea that we would abandon the women of Afghanistan uh, is a very bitter pill to swallow, including for organizations like the Feminist Majority Foundation. And I think that's important that we acknowledge that. Part of what uh, I wanted to get across today is that the military presence in Afghanistan isn't actually a constructive way to address those problems. We're not... We're not doing uh, counterterrorism, which would be focused much more on Al Qaeda uh, and have a much smaller footprint. We're not really doing counterinsurgency. Uh, there are there have been news stories about um, soldiers uh, of ours in Afghanistan complaining about the terms of engagement, which uh, are restricting their ability to kill civilians. And if you'll recall, one of the things generally you said is that one of the cornerstones of counterinsurgency is the idea that you protect civilians. Uh, and so if we have um, uh, men and women in our military saying that those, are, those restrictions are too much, clearly what they're trying to accomplish isn't counterinsurgency, at least not as we would traditionally think of it. But the kinds of things that we can do are very different than what we have been doing. And as a community, we have an opportunity to ask our Congress and our President to very much change course. If we want to help the women of Afghanistan, Substantial micro-lending programs might be a way to do that. Women for Women International has done some fantastic work in Afghanistan and countries like it in terms of improving the status of women inside their own households and therefore in the society as a whole. Um, there are things that we can do to help girl children, uh, girls in Afghanistan, 
Um, there are some studies that suggest that the most straightforward way, particularly in a country that is as impoverished as Afghanistan is, to get parents to send little girls to school is to provide them with school lunches. It turns out that the opportunity to not have to feed them for one meal a day is a significant incentive for sending them to school. Um, those aren't solutions down the barrel of a rifle. Those are things that we can do that will help um, return control of Afghanistan to the Afghans, help save the blood and treasure of this country, and allow us to continue to employ teachers in this country instead of spending a hundred billion dollars a year plus interest on our military presence in Afghanistan. Just to clarify, I think something you did just said there, and you complained from troops in Afghanistan that they were being restricted from activities that, that killed civilians. I think it was just that they were fairly overly restricted in going after the enemy in ways that could very you know could possibly kill civilians. I think that's an important distinction just to make the point that you know, this gets to the central, one of the central lessons of counterinsurgency, which is a, at all possible, don't get into a situation where you have to do counterinsurgency. Yeah, it's a hell of a position to be in to be shot at and not be able to shoot, shoot back. Or <coughs> a position where you might have to kill civilians because your Marines are being threatened. It's a, I hope nobody thinks that what goes on there is done lightly or with disregard for human life. I know people have killed civilians and they will go to their graves every day with that, uh, with that thought. I have a friend who just spent her, uh, just spent her family vacation with a brother who got back from Iraq five years ago. He still gets three hours of sleep at night and he cries every night. All right, so I hope no one here thinks that it's an idea that we just want looser rules of engagement so we can kill civilians. There's a, it, it's, it's a very difficult, horrible thing to put. And it comes down to, so that's what comes down to the argument about the wars. Is it worth it? Is it worth putting our young men and women in those positions where they're either being killed or they're killing? What do we get out of it? Um, so it's a very, it's, it's a very difficult position.